Now, the Taliban are still my favorite example of a group of people who are struggling mightily to build a society that is obviously less good than others on offer. The average lifespan for women in Afghanistan is 44 years. Okay, they have a, a literacy rate of 12%. They have almost the highest fertility rate in the world and almost the highest infant and maternal mortality in the world. This is one of the best places on earth to watch women and infants die. They also have a GDP that's lower than the world average in the year 1820. So it seems to me patently obvious that the optimal response to this situation, which is to say the most moral response, is not to throw battery acid in the faces of little girls for the crime of learning to read. Now, I think this is common sense to everyone in this room, and common sense it should be to everyone in the civilized world, except you, if you happen to be a bioethicist working on the President's Council at the moment. Uh, but this is also of necessity a claim about biology and psychology and sociology and economics. It, it is not unscientific to say that the Taliban are wrong about morality. In fact, we have to say this the moment we admit we know anything at all about human well-being. Now, some people with a little philosophical training may begin to wonder, well, who's to say that if a father wants to bur burn his daughter's face off with battery acid, he's wrong? in any objective sense. Okay, who's to say we should value the well-being of little girls? Who's to say that the father doesn't have a, an alternate but also legitimate conception of well-being? Now, moral skeptics of this kind invariably cite David Hume's famous distinction between is and ought. You, the, the notion is you can't get an ought from an is, which is to say that science can only give us a descriptive account of the way the world is, and there's no way to move from that account to an account of how the world ought to be. Now, I, I happen to think this is a trick of language. This notion of ought this, this falls very much into Wittgenstein's notion of philosophy as a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. And, and people are mightily bewitched by words like ought and should and, and moral duty. Now, to, to ask whether we ought to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone on my view, is nonsensical. If, if we ought to do anything, if we should do anything, if we have a moral duty to do anything in this universe, it's to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, there's no notion of ought that reaches deeper than the imperative of avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense to say, well, I would have avoided the worst possible misery for everyone, but I actually had other priorities. Okay, there, there, there's no space for those other priorities to occupy, or so I argue. Now, many people imagine on Hume's account that science is bound to be merely descriptive, and therefore one person's values can only trump another person's values by, by seeking consensus. There's no, you, all you have are, are differing opinions. And, there, and all such opinions are, in principle, on par. But this isn't true. There are many ways for my values to be wrong. Uh, but they can be wrong with respect to deeper values that I hold, or would hold if I were only a deeper person. They, my, my values can be objectively bad guides to finding happiness in this world. I can value things that will reliably make me miserable, or make those I love miserable. So, so Things can be right or wrong independent of a person's current values. Now, some of you might worry that I haven't defined well-being with sufficient precision. How can, how can this loose concept be uh, the ground out of which we talk about moral truth? Well, consider by analogy the notion of physical health. Okay. Physical health is very difficult to define. And, and, it, and its, its definition seems to always be con only contextually true. I mean, now, physical health is... You can expect to live to be 85, 90 without Alzheimer's. Uh, 100 years ago, you could expect to live to the ripe old age of 40 or 50. Okay, it changes, and it could change uh, to a great degree in the future. The, what does health mean? So it has something to do with not always vomiting. It has something to do with not being in excruciating pain. And this is, these are very loose criteria for health. 
And yet this does not make the concept of health vacuous at all. It certainly doesn't make it merely the product of culture or merely the product of, of personal whim. And notice that no one ever attacks the philosophical underpinnings of medicine with questions like, well, who are you to say that not always vomiting is healthy? You know, what if you meet someone who wants to vomit? What if you meet someone who wants to vomit until he dies? How would you argue that he's not as healthy as you are? Okay, the, yes, the very notion of health contains certain values. This does not make medicine unscientific. Okay, and, I, and I would argue that in talking about morality, we are actually talking about psychological health and the health of societies. The truth of this, this fact-value uh, issue actually reaches deeper than that because science has always been in the values business. We simply cannot speak about facts without embracing certain values. It's not, it's not that you can't get an ought from an is. You can't get an is without embracing certain oughts. And consider the simplest statement of scientific fact. Water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. This, this seems to be as value-free an utterance as human beings ever make. Okay, but what do we do when someone doubts the truth of this proposition? What if, what if someone comes forward and says, well, I'm sorry, but that's not how I choose to think about water. Okay, what if someone says, I'm a biblical chemist, and I read in Genesis 1 that God created water before he created light, which, in fact, it says in Genesis 1. So, therefore, there were no stars to fuse hydrogen and helium into heavier elements like oxygen. So there would have been no oxygen to put in the water. So God either made... Either there's no oxygen in water or God made special oxygen. And I don't, I don't believe he'd do that because that would be biblically inelegant. <laughs> okay. what, what could we possibly do with such a person? Okay. All we can do is appeal to scientific values. Okay. And if, if a person doesn't share those values, the conversation is over. Okay. We, we, we must appeal to the value of understanding the world, the value of evidence, in this case, some hundreds of years of, of evidence in chemistry, the value of logical consistency. Much of what we believe about the world is predicated on the validity of our beliefs about the structure of water. If someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence are you going to provide that proves they should value it? If someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument could you invoke to prove that they should value logic? Okay, and I, I think the split between facts and values should just look bizarre on its face, because what, what are we really saying when we say that science can't be applied to the most important questions in human life? We're saying that, that when we really relinquish our biases, when we make every effort to get behind our wishful thinking and self-deception, when we rely most clearly on honest observation and, and sound reasoning, when, when intellectual honesty is at its peak, well, then that has no application whatsoever to the most important questions in human life. That's precisely the mood you cannot be in to answer the most important questions in human life. So I'd argue to you that, that thinking of moral truth in the context of science, and indeed a science of morality, should only pose a problem for you if you think a science of morality must be absolutely self-justifying in a way that no branch of science can be. Okay, science and morality based on a concern for well-being would be on the same footing as, as, as a science of medicine based on a concern for health, or indeed any other science that has to assume certain axiomatic assumptions. There are many questions you could ask that are, that are, are actually good questions. Uh, one would be, how would this work in practice? I mean, they, they, we, we, can, we often have values, that, genuine values, that can be in competition with one another, can be trade-offs between values. How do we balance one person's well-being against the well-being of the group? How do we evaluate the consequences of, of our actions when the consequences seem to go on forever? So you take, for instance, the, this recent tragedy in Japan. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it certainly seems bad, but what if this causes us to handle nuclear materials so much more conscientiously than we ever would have in the future that it winds up saving millions of lives. These are all good questions, but I would argue these are not a retort 
to the argument I've given you. Okay? It, it could be difficult or impossible to answer some of these questions. But in every area of science, in every area where we acknowledge that truth claims are valid, there are an infinite number of questions that are indeed difficult or impossible to answer. This does not nullify truth claims. I mean, this is my favorite example of the moment is how many birds are in flight over the surface of the earth. Okay, we don't know, we can't know, we will never know, and in, in fact, it just changed. Okay, there's, there's no scientific effort that could deliver those data. And yet we know there's a, there's a simple answer. It's, it's just an integer. This could well be true of certain questions about morality. This would not uh, nullify the, the, the reality of, of moral truth. So in, in closing, I just want to remind you of why religion can't be the answer to the question of moral truth. Well, first, there's just the simple fact that all of our scriptures were written by people who by virtue of their placement in history, had less access to scientific knowledge and what is now basic common sense than any person in this room. In fact, there's not a person in this room who has ever met a person whose worldview is as narrow as the worldview of Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. This is, these people knew nothing, next to nothing, that is now of the facts that are now relevant to us in the 21st century. They knew nothing about the, the origins of life, the relationship between mind and brain. They didn't know that mental illness was a, a, even a category of human suffering. They knew nothing about DNA or viruses or computation or electricity. Uh, none of this is in Scripture. Okay, they, they had no idea why people got sick and died. I mean, unless, unless you saw someone stabbed with a spear, you had no idea why they died. And in moral terms... With, with a few notable exceptions, most of these people were no wiser than, than your average Afghan warlord today. Okay, they had absolute, the most had absolutely no notion that slavery was problematic, that, that it was, there was something morally unsavory about owning people and treating them like farm equipment. Okay, Jesus and his apostles couldn't see that slavery was worth condemning. In closing, I just want to suggest to you that just as we don't have Christian physics, though the Christians invented physics, and we don't have Muslim algebra, though the Muslims invented algebra, we, at some point, will not have Christian and Muslim morality. Okay, the, the truth has to float free of these uh, uh, provincial ideas. What, what remains for us to discover are all the facts that relate to genuine questions of human well-being. And, and the goal, clearly, is to build a global civilization based on shared values. Now, it seems to me the only tool we need to do that is honest and open inquiry. And if faith is ever right about anything in this space, it's just right by accident. Thank you very much.